started, I'm going to ask all of you to stand up. Don't worry, we're not playing Simon Says. It's okay. Um, and I'm going to ask you a question. And if the answer is yes to the question, stay standing. If the answer is no, you can sit down. So first question, um, are you a student at ETAP? I figured that would weed out a couple of you pretty quickly. Um, the second, how many of you are graduating this year? Oh, all of you. So is this a senior invite only? Or is it just that you're um, realizing you're hitting the job market and so this is a good way to network? If, well, let's try this again. Everybody stand up. Okay, if the answer is yes, stay standing. If the answer is no, sit down. So, are you graduating this year? Okay, so nobody, only one of you is graduating this year. The rest of you are in what year? Third year? First year, freshman. Okay. All right, um, that helps me gauge. So that means you're probably all exploring a little bit of what you want to study. So here we go. Next set of questions, stand up and sit down again. Oh, I'm sorry. If you're, you only have to stand up if you're a student. But you're welcome to join in if you'd like and just pretend that you're in their phase. Okay, so how many of you know what you want to major in? If it's a yes, stay standing. If it's a no, sit down. So you all know what you want to major in. Wow, that's very cool. Um, so, and you're, you're all American? Because it's usually... This question is, in Australia, is the only time where I find somebody comes into school and they already know what they want to study. Okay, so, all right. Second, um, how many of you can identify at least three different occupations or jobs that you can do with the degree you want to pursue? So all of you can think of at least three occupations or jobs related that you want to pursue with what you want to study. That's really cool, okay. And then last, um, how many of you talk to somebody who's doing what you want to do? All of you, almost all of you have talked to somebody. How about talk to more than one person? Okay, so that's helpful. All right, you can sit down. I'm not gonna ask any more stand up, sit down questions. Um, it just helps me gauge how focused you guys are and what you really need and what you're looking for. Um, so now with just a show of hands, how many of you are studying economics? Okay, how many of you are studying data science or a data science related degree? Oh, you gotta put your hands up higher so I can see two. So the rest of you are not studying economics or data science. Um, business? Yeah, yes? Okay, and in what's the difference between business and economics? Aside from the course selection, but like in practicality, what's the difference? Mm, no takers? Okay. Um, so that means that um, my background is I'm an economist, um, or I, I pretend to be on a good day. Um, which means that a lot of my, my experience in terms of studying economics or doing work in the economics field, as well as how it relates to data science is probably not relevant to you. How many of you think that like understanding data and playing with data is gonna be important to your career regardless of what you study? Okay, so why is that important and you don't study data science? Any takers? 
I mean, I can, I can answer it from, from my perspective as, as somebody who studied economics, and that's, that's because um, as an economist, all we do is look at data. And so, I mean, in some ways, if I if I'm, had a glass of wine, I would say that, well, we were the original data scientists. But I think there's probably some people in um, the hard sciences that would argue that point. Um, okay. So, My name's Naomi Young. I am the director of the Center for Regional Analysis. I'm fairly new at the center, along with the center actually being new. We were established a year ago. Um, my background is that I have over 20 years of experience doing policy and economic consulting in the United States and Australia. Um, if you ask me what I do or what I specialize in prior to this role, I would have said that I'm an environmental economist. So um, you can already see how the idea of being an environmental economist and now being the director of a center for economic development is um, an interesting sidestep. So a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is how that happened. Um, the EDC, so the Center for Regional Analysis is part of a family of organizations focused on economic development. How many of you know who EDC is? The Economic Development Company of Lancaster County? Okay. Um, did you have Lancaster City Alliance Jeremy Young speak here last week? Okay, did he consider himself an economic development specialist or with an organization that focuses on economic development? I, I tried to look at his lecture, I didn't, get it, I didn't see it up yet, so. Okay, so we all know what economic development's about. Okay, um, so unlike the City Alliance, we're actually focused on the county-wide perspective for the economy. City Alliance is obviously focused on Lancaster City. Um, and the EDC family or the Economic Development family, it's, it's three organizations. It's the, the Economic Development Company of Lancaster County, it's EDC Finance, and then the Center for Regional Analysis. Um, EDC works directly with local businesses and local government with the intentional focus on business retention and expansion. Unlike other economic development organizations, our efforts are not looking at attraction. And the shift away from attracting businesses makes a lot of sense in Lancaster's context. Um, I don't know how many of you realize Lancaster is extremely land constrained. Um, I mean, that seems like a funny thing to say because obviously the size of counties don't really change. But what I mean by that is um, we have an awful lot of land that's just of land that's dedicated to agricultural production. Does anybody have an idea how much of Lancaster County is devoted to agriculture or zoned to agriculture? To take a guess, yeah. Maybe like 40%. Okay, anybody think that it's more than that? How, how much? Probably closer to 60. Okay, um, any, any takers on more than 60%? Okay, how about, how many of you think it's less than 40%? Okay, so pretty close. Um, over two thirds of Lancaster County is um, used for agricultural production. Now, how much of our GDP or our local economic activity is actually attributed to agriculture? Anybody have an idea? Do you think it's on par with the amount of land that we use? Go ahead. I don't think it's, no. More or less? So, less. How much less? 30%. 30 Anybody think it's more or less than 30% of our GDP? Um, okay. Uh, so it's, it's actually 3%. So what this means is that we use roughly one third of our land to support most of Lancaster County's economic activity. That's where uh, 540,000 people live, sleep, shop, recreate. It's also where um, roughly 10,000 Lancaster businesses operate. So all of their housing, their manufacturing, their retail activities, health services, all of that is, is really loaded onto one third of our land. Um, I think that's actually quite <coughs> an astonishing figure to think about how vibrant Lancaster's economy is. And it also really highlights why data analytics and understanding some fundamentals become so important when you think about development strategies. Um, we all rely on simplifying heuristics, so it's really natural for us to look around and believe what we see to be representative of the truth. 
And so you can already see where there's a disconnect. If you read the newspapers, you look around, you would think that agriculture is a really important part of our economy. And it's something that warrants resources, limited public dollars to support, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's so much of our land that of course we should be thinking that it's important. But when you think about the economic activities that happen in Lancaster County, we're using our resources incredibly well. If you think one third of our land supports a population of over half a million people, 10,000 businesses, and has a growing economy. I mean, that's quite astonishing. And I think it bucks the perception about Lancaster County being agricultural, rural, backwards, um, and it probably has some lessons for bigger cities in thinking about the effectiveness of their land use. Um, but it also means that, coming back to EDC, our focus on business retention and expansion rather than attraction makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you think about having only one third of your land, when you have a growing business, all of a sudden trying to find a new space to expand into or to relocate to meet your new needs becomes incredibly difficult. Um, and if we don't think about retention and expansion, we're losing opportunities because we all know businesses and labor are mobile. So EDC plays a really important in this space. They act as a conduit to economic development funds and dollars. They coordinate activities across different players from local government to, um, to the businesses. And lastly, they provide referrals to local experts and service providers. Um, what I'm not listing, which is probably the most important thing, is that EDC provides a base, a place for getting credible, reliable, reputable advice on just how Lancaster County works. Um, and oftentimes that becomes really important. So if you take a step back and you think about our businesses, a good portion of our businesses are actually national or international. They might have been homegrown at some point, but they've been acquired. You know, there's equity and mergers and acquisitions that are happening all the time which means that all of a sudden management of those companies are not based in Pennsylvania. And we all know Pennsylvania is a really unique state, right? Does anybody know why Pennsylvania is so unique compared to other states, aside from the fact that we're a commonwealth? Okay, well, it, part of it is the fragmentation of government. So when you look at other states and you think about what the smallest unit government is, the, the breakdown of that and who controls certain aspects in terms of land use decisions, who can, what types of taxes can be levered, are all based on your local government structure. And so oftentimes what we do is we'll see strategies from Maryland, for example, and people say, why can't you do that here in Pennsylvania? Well, you can't because of our local government structure. It also means that businesses headquartered in other states, like Maryland, for example, are going to think that they can come in and they can get a land use or an application through really quickly, not realizing that they actually have to work with a local government that has a population that they service of less than 5,000 people and a part-time board of supervisors. So this is all the stuff that like the EDC also helps in terms of facilitating that is part of actually business retention that we wouldn't typically think of in a world where there is lots of mergers and acquisitions and our, our global connectivity. So those insights become really important along with the, just the, the social and political capital of being able to know who to talk to and, and facilitate connections. Now EDC Finance is our second sister organization, our other sister organization, and they're, um, they really hold the purse strings to some extent. So their focus is on helping businesses access economic development resources. So these are funds that help and assist businesses with the intention of incentivizing capital improvements and job growth. So what do I mean by capital improvements? Anybody? Okay, capital improvements, business expansion, new equipment in your facilities. Um, basically everything that you think of that actually improves your productivity and your output. Um, and these resources are typically supporting small businesses by providing favorable financing that can either complement or be an alternative to commercial, biz commercial banks. So what this means, like in layman terms, I think that we can all understand, is um, long-term low interest loans, um, which just makes the cost of capital lower, makes it easier for them to make the investments. Um, so the Center for Regional Analysis is the newest piece. Now we are basically the ivory tower in the economic development world. Um, 
were a novel idea. So, you, you know, ironically, economic development doesn't typically involve ec um, economics. It's, um, if you think about it, it, it tends to involve and engage a multidisciplinary team. And these are comprised of planners, policy analysts, reform bankers, because again, it's about connecting businesses to capital and site selection. Um, and what that means is that you get an economic development view that's driven around understanding what the community wants, its aspirations in terms of amenities, quality of life, as well as what are considered favorable business conditions. So economic development sets a lofty <coughs> goal. So it'll be like um, resilience of your economy. It can be growth of X percent over X years, job creation target numbers. Um, and then the, the economic development practitioners, they're just gonna follow this blueprint and they're gonna implement it on a site-by-site, -site, business by business basis. So piecemeal, with the belief that if you lay the brickwork, you'll have the, the infrastructure that you want in place. Um, and, and that's a challenging work. I, I'm not disparaging it in any sense. Because if you think about it, the toolbox for economic development is a mix of fragmented policy levers and funding mechanisms. And again, coming back to Pennsylvania, think about when you want to expand a company, how many levels of government do you need to involve in, in order to actually get land use approval, maybe access to utilities if the site hasn't had anything on it previously, um, financing at the state level, if you want to have some of those loans that are available. So you can see how it involves this really complex ecosystem. Um, and I, I don't want to give the impression either that when they're doing this work of aspirations that economic development isn't involving data. I mean, it does. They're counting the job creation because it's really fundamental to some of the access and the tools, some of the tools that they access. Um, they're looking at the number of businesses impacted. They're, they're looking at implications for tax revenue. So these are all really important indicators. But you can also see how that when we talk about that, we can lose sight of what the broader economic implications are. So I'm gonna give you an example of that. How many of you have heard of QVC? Okay, how many of you know QVC's leaving Lancaster County? Okay, so, um, so for example, QVC has been in Lancaster County for a long time, and last October they actually announced that they're relocating their facility to Bethlehem. Um, and so this is a great example of exactly why EDC of Lancaster County is focused on business retention expansion. Um, clearly an important em employer like QVC with over with a couple hundred employees and a, and a well-established record is a good employer. It's, it's, um, it doesn't look good when we move into a neighboring county. Um, and it has to raise questions about well, what, what was it that made them more favorable to relocate and invest in a new facility rather than just maintain their current labor pool and site. And so, as I said, its closure amounts to hundreds of jobs being lost um, and a lot of foregone local tax revenue. So it's easy to understand this effect on a local level. I mean, all of us can relate to the idea of a couple hundred people losing their jobs, a business with a large site um, shuttering up. But from an economic and a data-driven perspective, we have to ask one question. <coughs> Does job loss translate into increased unemployment and truly lost tax revenue? Now, if we think about the indicators of economic development, we lose sight of that, right? Because we're counting the number of jobs created or possibly the number of jobs lost, the number of businesses that stay or how they grow. So on the indicators that economic development follows, this is a devastating impact. But let's put it back with an economic lens and, and put that through the filter what QVC means. So remember, actually let me just take, take a step back. How many of you know what the current unemployment level is in Lancaster County? Okay, it's around 3%. Is that high or low? <coughs> it's really low. Um, is it better than the nation? Yes. There you go. So what does that mean? That means we have a tight labor market, right? We have Anybody know how many vacancies we have right now, job postings? Around 10,000. How many people with a 3% unemployment rate, how many people are, how many people do we have that are unemployed? 
a lot less than 10,000. So the, the point is that if you think about it in that context, in a tight labor market with lots of job openings, um, is it necessarily a bad thing when QVC shutters up? Are we losing, are we gonna bump up our unemployment? Are we going to see a problem with unemployment? In the current labor market, probably not. And more importantly, the question is, um, is, it, is it always bad when we, in a, in a labor-constrained market, in a land-constrained market, that if QVC is shuttering up, that maybe there's gonna be a better, better use for that property. Um, so, so what this means is that we, we as, as an economist, we also think about something that's called productive dynamism. So in other words, it's this idea that things can, can um, die and new things come in place. It's this, this kind of creative destruction and renewal and innovation. And it's that churn that often leads to economic growth. And so in a labor and land constrained economy that is growing really well, you have to question whether or not something like QVC shuttering up means that it's signaling either this produ productive renewal opportunity or is it actually signaling a business cycle downturn. And so if we just look at our simple indicators of you know, jobs created or job lost, um, how many businesses impacted, tax changes, we lose sight of this, cr this productive, creative, and um, loss in build that should be happening in our economy. Um, so the QVC site, I mean, one premise is that maybe it actually opens up the opportunity for another business to expand and it brings in higher quality jobs in warehousing. I mean, we just have to wonder, or higher quality jobs in retail. Um, and so I know this thinking is a little provocative, and I'm not suggesting that company closures, job loss, and um, effectively forced relocations is a good idea. I mean, it absolutely impacts the community, and it absolutely impacts the people that work there. Um, and these are all experiences that we all want to avoid, right? So I'm, I'm not saying that we, shouldn't, we, shouldn't, we should be callous about that. But with an economic lens, what I am saying is that um, economic development is about having resiliency. And so what we should be concerned about, not so much is that loss, but do we have good conditions to say that it's actually gonna turn into a freeing up of resources to have higher use? And we also wanna think about whether or not it, we have the right tools in place to minimize the frictions. Anybody know what I mean by saying frictions? The frictions are the challenges that you have when you get, when you're let go from one company to secure yourself in another position. So you can think about frictions as uh, barriers to being able to, to transition to a new job, barriers for one company to relocate or to, to occupy a site. And so from an economic lens, what we're concerned about isn't counting those indicators of economic development, but thinking about do we have the enabling conditions and the sufficient mechanisms to ease the reallocation of labor and land to a newer, higher value use. And that is not talk that comes into economic development. And that's the space that the center <coughs> builds. Okay, so let me get back again to really describing the center. Um, I've given you a little bit of a flavor about how we're approaching issues of economic development and how we think. Um, and at the core of what we do, we answer policy and business leader questions using an economic analysis or an economic framework and data. So the mantra at the center is that we are not a data warehouse, we analyze data. The mantra at the center is absolutely we have a bias in how we conduct research. That bias is that we rely on economic theory and an economic framework. Um, and the questions that we tackle range from understanding how, um, how particular occupations lead to upward economic mobility to evaluating the potential market share of a company as they think about moving into a new regional area. Um, so it's, it's anything and everything. Um, I like to say that our, our universe is um, centered in Lancaster and we don't really know where our boundaries are except that in our title is regional and the way we've defined regional is that we stay out of markets and economies of a million plus population. So 
Um, I actually know where my universe ends to the east. It's Philadelphia. Um, and it can skip over Pittsburgh, and that's OK. Um, all right. Um, and so that says a little bit about what we do. And our core tools are all the things that data science degrees involve. So we use ArcGIS, R, Python, Tableau. Plus, we're using economic tools like Stata and Implant. So our, our job is to, to really find data, grab it, mine it, model it, and visualize it. And to do that in a way that we actually help people avoid life as a random walk. And what I mean by a random walk is that we break the paradigm of what you did yesterday is going to be your best strategy for what you do tomorrow. And instead, what we're doing is we're having them question whether or not the simplifying heuristics are, are really leading them to better decisions. So that's a little bit about the center. No, OK, 11.30. I'm good. So now I'm going to just talk a little bit about my career and what that means in, in thinking about data and economics. And this is where um, I apologize. That part of the lecture is, uh, didn't make it with me. But I had like basically four themes or lessons learned from me. Um, it's just a really quick background. I, I had a meandering career. Um, I did a, I have a master's in public policy from Carnegie Mellon, and then I have a master's in economics and applied econometrics from the University of Delaware. So I am, I am a nerd. I do like looking at data. Um, I firmly believe in visualization of almost every problem in a supply and demand model. Um, it's just a discipline that, that um, has, I've embraced. Um, but when I started out, um, I did a, well, let me just say, let me start with my first, my first thought. You gotta have your fundamentals. Whatever career, whatever thing you study, there are fundamentals and they need to be solid. Um, you don't lead with those. You lead with your thinking because the fundamentals are a given. They're supposed to be what screen to even bring you to the table. And so make sure that they're in shape. But what you really want to do is show how you think. So for example, when I was at, um, was at Carnegie Mellon, I was just finishing up my master's, my first job out of school, I'm interviewing. And I didn't actually, um, I hadn't actually planned on doing a master's in public policy. I, and I had a plan on entering the career, um, entering the workforce at that point. I had planned on actually going on doing a PhD. Um, and so I was like, oh, well, I'll buy some time, earn some money, pay off some student loan debt, and then go back. And so my, um, my master's thesis was um, we do capstone projects. And it was actually designing a gun buyback program um, for the city of Pittsburgh. My first job out of, um, out of grad school was working for an environmental consulting firm. So I landed this job not knowing what the Clean Water Act is or what the Clean Air Act is. I had no idea at all about the environment, nor was I terribly interested in it. But I took the job for two reasons. One, um, I, I loved the way they thought. And I got the job, and I beat out people from Yale School of Forestry because I knew how to think about a problem in a policy and in a policy analysis framework. So the fundamentals were given. Everybody who got an interview for this job had strong analytic skills. What gets you over the line is how you think and how you can apply those skills. So don't underestimate the importance of the fundamentals, but recognize that that's just a given. Demonstrate how you think. Um, so the second thing that I would say is to think about what career pathways mean. So coming back to taking this job, I took this job because, one, it was a great interview. It was a lot of fun. I wanted to do federal policy work. I didn't want to be in DC. This was a job that was based in Boston. Um, they had clear career pathways. And more importantly, it was a consulting job. And prior to that, I had interned at the Urban Institute. So my, my other offer was to actually go into a think tank. Um, and I loved the idea of trying to understand how to sell work. Um, which is not a skill set you typically associate with economists or data scientists. Um, and so 
when I looked at this, I thought, oh, this is going to be great, because I also knew that uh, if I had taken a job at Urban Institute, all the successful principal investigators um, have to raise money. So there's nothing unique to, to research and philanthropy or nonprofits that gets you away from the need to have revenue to sustain your operations. And so I thought doing a consulting strategy or a consulting job first out was going to give me those skills so that then I could go back to my PhD and then I could go back into a think tank and then I'd be well positioned to know how to raise revenue to fund the research I wanted to do. Um, so that brings me to my second point, which is that with any anything that you pursue, whatever your degree is and the jobs that you're looking at, know the career pathways. That's getting harder and harder to do. We're in an economy and an environment where organizations tend to be flat. That means that we don't get to see those clear steps on how we progress up and have increasing responsibilities. And I think as that becomes more ambiguous and more flat, it becomes even more important for you to spend time thinking about that. Because if you don't, you're going to fall into my third point, which is the Peter's Principle. Anybody know what Peter's Principle is? Yes. <laughs> Do you want to tell them? No, well, it's in a, in a hierarchy. Everybody rises to the level of incompetency. Absolutely. This is a huge theme in life. We are promoted on our potential. So what does that mean? You haven't demonstrated that you can do it. That also means that there's a good risk that you get hired for your potential, and that really wasn't your potential. So that's one scary aspect, too. But the other part is that we do well what we do. And as we progress, and we move through a hierarchy or a flat organization with changing roles, it means that your skill set and your activities are different. And there is always risk in that. And so what you want to do is make sure you know what these career pathways look like so that you avoid Peter's principle. So coming back to the data scientist or an economist, so you start out and you know at, at an entry level in a consulting firm or even in a, in a think tank like ours, or a research organization like ours, we're hiring you on your fundamental skills and a little bit about how you think, right? And so what we're looking for is can you produce really good visualization? Can you give me some good insight? And can you communicate it? But if you're going to stay in this type of career, or this career pathway, at some point, there's a, there's a choice where you either stay purely research, data-driven analysis, or you start thinking about how do you develop your own reputation and secure the revenue streams that you need in order to do the research agenda you want. And if that pathway, which most organizations require, especially if you want to have salary growth, that is a different skill set than why you even started out thinking about data analytics or science or, or um, economics. So in other words, all of a sudden, you have to stop thinking about, did the, did, this, did the data speak to me? Did it tell a good story? To thinking about who really cares and who can I convince to pay me to do more on what I think is interesting? And I mean, so we can already see what kind of skill set differences there are. I mean, all of a sudden, you could be an awesome programmer, and you can clean data like crazy, you can model like crazy, but that does not mean that you can explain those findings to somebody and have them understand why they should invest a lot of money to, help, to have you help them do that with their data. So avoid Peter's principle. Understand the career pathways and where you go. And understand, too, that, and I think actually all of you do, because you're not your um, post-Gen Xers, um, that exiting organizations is really important. Um, exiting organizations is a way that you be, you're able to get good salary increases, test your potential, and have the biggest leap of faith on what you can deliver. And so that means that as you think about your career pathways and avoiding the Peter Principle, it's not just thinking about that within the, the organization that you first enter into. It's actually thinking about what you want in terms of your job, job three, five, 10, 15 years out. And to make sure that maybe you don't have all those skills, but be aware of whether or not you're going to have to go back to acquire them to keep progressing. So for example, um, I was actually a little bit relieved that there were not too many people here that um, were studying economics. Um, so 
and, and I only say that because um, some disciplines really require advanced degrees. And so if you're studying economics, if you want to continue to have career progression, you should pretty much bank on needing to do a PhD at some point. Um, and if you don't, then your, um, your advancement level opportunities are severely limited. This was something I didn't fully appreciate um, when, I, when I started. Um, I thought, oh great, you know, I'm getting a master's from Carnegie Mellon, off of me. Um, I, I'm on a good career trajectory, have solid income, and um, I'm not gonna hit a ceiling. But what I've, what I've found, and this is through working in both Australia and the United States, is that that's not necessarily true. So I call myself an economist, um, but I don't have a PhD in economics. And um, in reality, if somebody was asking me what I really am, it's a policy analyst um, and, um, and a consultant. So, um, so my last, and my last piece of advice, uh, and I'm gonna ground this in, in my own personal experience, so um, again, coming back to first job out of grad school, I'm in Boston, I'm doing environmental policy. And, um, and then I decided that, well, I mean, it's the environmental world, so what could be more fascinating and awesome than to go into a developing country and do environmental economics? I mean, think about all the issues that are associated with that, like access to clean water, public health issues. I mean, these are just, these are just incredibly sexy topics to work on that just give you immediate, like, cred of interest. Um, and I'm looking around and I'm realizing that in order for me to, to pursue that type of pathway, particularly in interna international markets, I need experience living in a developing country. So um, I start talking to people and, and one of the themes that I hear all the time is that, oh, well, you know, the U.S. Embassy hires locally, so, and they're cheaper. They like to hire local staff because they don't have to pay U.S. wages. So a light bulb goes off in my head and I'm like, hey, I'll go overseas and I'll network my way in as a local on the other side because, well, one, I'll have the advantage of speaking English, two, I have a U.S. degree, and three, they don't have to pay me U.S. wages. So I thought this was a brilliant strategy. And um, what that meant is I took a job teaching English in China for a year thinking that I'd be able to network my way into the Beijing Embassy. Um, I learned one really important lesson from that, and that is that um, whoever writes a contract and it's core to their business probably knows how that contract is gonna work better and in their favor than you think. So I was a consultant working 60 hours a week. I took this teaching job which I was like, great, it's only five days a week and I only have to teach 20 hours a week. So I was like, oh my God, this is just, I mean, already it's like a full-time job that I don't have to do in terms of hours gained. Um, I thought I'd be able to travel and network my way in and what I discovered was that they, um, they were actually very clever. You never got two days off in a row because if you had two consecutive days off, it meant you can travel. And if you travel, you're not as likely to come back and teach on time. They also made sure that your teaching schedules were, sta were staggered in a way that you never had um, a day, a full day off between teaching. Because again, with a full day off, you might just do a quick jaunt someplace else. So I learned a really important role, in, in important aspect about contracts. My point is that when you do sign a contract, read it. Um, it's a really important piece. But, so I, I went into China and meandered around and then um, eventually landed in Australia and um, just picked right up from what I had done in the US. So even though in Australia, I work for a place called the Center for International Economics, and in Australia we deal with competition issues um, because it's a, introducing competition into regulated markets is a really important aspect of their economic development. Um, there was still the theme of strong policy analysis, strong economic fundamentals, um, in a data-driven approach. So we kept with this one theme. And even with the economic development company where I'm at now, there's still that one continuous theme of strong data analytics and the fundamental of economics, even though the context, be it the country or the topic, has changed. So as you move through your careers, and you should meander, Make sure that you always have one common thread of a strength 
that you can show through your resume. So thank you.